Welcome to this care collab on Maxillaria tenuifolia. I really appreciate the time you're taking to watch my video. Thank you for being here. I have a lot to talk about when it comes to this orchid, just because there's been such a history with her in my collection. Participating channels, all their links will be in the description as per usual. And let me tell you that I am in southern Spain in a very let's say intermediate to hot climate. If we go by temperatures, not by how I personally feel about this climate, I find it far too cold. <laughs> but let's just say my temperatures range from five degrees Celsius in the winter all the way up to 40 degrees and higher. Should we be blessed with such high temperatures on occasions down here in Southern Spain? The reason I am saying all that is because, let's get it out of the way, I grow my Maxillaria tenuifolia outdoors all year round and she moves around the patio depending on where there's space where there's shade where there's not too much sun or in the winter she's bang in the middle of the patio table because she gets direct sun throughout the winter which gives you an indication of how much light I'm giving this orchid my winters being considered mild the sun will not hurt or affect the orchid in any way and when the sun shines she gets around six to seven hours of sunshine during the day and temperatures would be around 17 18 degrees celsius but during the summer when things get a little bit warmer then i try to keep her protected and away from the blistering hot sun during the noontime hours if she gets late afternoon sun that's fine with me if she gets early morning sun that's fine with me as well so her location on my patio switches around She's one of those nomadic orchids, if I can say it like that, when it comes to her location. Now, as I'm standing here, let's just get the obvious out of the way. The blooms are astounding. Finally, I have a show that I consider a show considering her history with me. And this is where the genus gets its name from, Maxillaria, which comes from the Latin word maxilla. And that word means jawbone. And some of the species of maxillarias have a lip or column which look like a protruding jaw. I cannot confirm that when it comes to my tenuifolia and also with my variabilis. I don't see that jawline, but okay, I may not have the imagination that the discoverers of this genus had back in the day. But she's also called the coconut orchid for obvious reasons. Obvious when you're standing in front of her and can appreciate that beautiful coconut fragrance that she has. It is pretty strong, but not invasive. It is not off-putting. It is not sickly sweet. Even though I'm outdoors, I'm standing like a a meter away from this orchid I can definitely appreciate that fragrance from this distance it's like you're lying on a beach and somebody next to you has some sun protection on them and it smells of coconut you know Hawaiian tropic back in the day make it glisten make it shine make yourself look slippery and reek of coconut if it is on your personal body but from a distance you can have that similar kind of a waft of coconut fragrance and that is what this orchid does it doesn't even get more intense the closer you you get to the blooms. If this orchid had an aura, it would just be coconut. It's gorgeous. The one thing I do wish evolution would have taken care of was to open up the petals. They are closed up and around the column which is a shame because the whole interest of these blooms are deep within that throat and the petals have gorgeous markings of rich burgundy dark red spotting. Imagine those petals being open as well. You would get a fuller and a much nicer impact of all those intricate markings. That's just my personal preference on this orchid. But she's not only called the coconut orchid, she's also called the delicate leafed orchid because of the sickle-like leaves that she has in comparison to the variabilis which is a little bit more of a broader leaf. The leaf structure of this orchid has a semblance of grasses. There's another synonym for this orchid as well, Maxillariella. Say that name five times really really fast and see how quickly your tongue goes into a knot. She's also called Maxillariella tenuifolia and when I received this orchid that's what I thought I had because my orchid is very, very compact for a maxillaria tenuifolia. Normally you see the pseudobulbs as a dark green and they're quite large, almost the size of an egg. And the rhizome as well is much more elongated, adding to another pseudobulb with a very dark green, somewhat oval shaped egg. My pseudobulbs are around the size of a walnut and my rhizomes are also very, very small. So when I received this orchid back in the day from a nursery that I consider rather dodgy, 
Georgie, I thought, well, first of all, she was small. So I figured, okay, we've got a seedling here. But what I didn't see was the extended rhizome and the growth of the pseudobulbs becoming more sizable as the years went on. And she didn't bloom for me for about two, maybe three years, even though she grew well. Initially, I had her in a small little deli container that I put holes into. And because it was a rectangle, taking into consideration the growth habit of this orchid, I had her in ceramics because, you know, high water requirements. But eventually I thought this is ridiculous if this orchid is what I think it is and it is not mislabeled. I might as well accommodate her for the future as opposed to judging what I'm seeing now. But you can see that after all these years, she is still a compact maxillaria tenuifolia and not the standard one that we see around a lot. And that's why I thought I had a maxillariella tenuifolia, a different form of tenuifolia. Turns out she is a maxillaria tenuifolia, COC. Maxillariella is just a synonym. Now you may also say, well, you give your tenuifolia a lot of light and that's why the rhizomes aren't reaching or are not extending. But when I look on the internet, I also see this form up on the tree branches growing epiphytically, very compact, and they are more in the shade. So I just drew my conclusion that there are two forms. From what I could gather, none of them have been identified as two separate forms. It's just the way it is. Some are a little bit more elongated and larger, and some are smaller. Turns out, though, that I'm pretty pleased to have this compact one because the long ones, the leggy ones, they will get very, very large very, very quickly. Even though mine lives outdoors all year round, space is an issue. If you're growing a maxillaria tenuifolia really, really well, and you are forced to grow it in a pot because your conditions do not permit growing it epiphytically mounted on a tree branch or something like that, this compact form has worked in my favor because I don't have a long leggy dangling all over the place maxillaria tenuifolia. The downside though with having the compact form is she isn't as fast a grower as the other one, the more gangly one, let's put it that way. This one has grown very, very slowly for me. And let's put that into perspective. I say slow because of everything I read up about her prior to purchasing her. I expected something a little bit more vigorous when I got this tenorifolia. And she only bloomed for me for the first time last year. And what a relief that was to see that one bloom because it was the moment I could actually say I've got a maxillaria tenuifolia. But that took almost three years and that is why I am so happy to see all these blooms this year because now I can definitely say she is vigorous in her own right and she's going to be doing this year in year out. The only other comparison that I've had over the years is my maxillaria variabilis which is growing like an absolute weed. And then I sort of put the two and two together wrongly so thinking my tenuifolia should be behaving the same way. This compact variety doesn't do that. And then when you see the blooms, you're already looking for the next new growth, but there is no rhyme or reason either where the new growth comes out. Sometimes it's on the opposite side of the pseudobulb where the bloom is, and sometimes it's coming right out where the bloom comes out of the pseudobulb. So it's not like you can start digging around and looking to see the opposite side and know exactly where your new growth is coming from. There is no rhyme or reason. It just happens the way the orchid perceives it best. My setup you can see is Lekka and Semi Hydro only, and the holes are in the back. This is fabulous for my climate because I consider my climate to be extremely dry. What I would have done differently if I were to get this one new in my collection was to change the size of the lecker into small lecker only. So the lecker in this pot is all mixed up, very large to very small. Didn't seem to bother her at all. She's completely pot bound. I could lift the whole orchid, the pot and everything in one go and nothing would slip out. I flush this orchid a lot as in every single day. I give her a good flush of one jug of plain RO water early afternoon. I do this every day because in the morning she gets one jug of fertilized water or calcium, magnesium and seaweed water so that the afternoon is the flush and there will be no salt accumulation on the leka. Now that she's matured to this size for the past two years, I've been giving her 300 parts per million of fertilizer and every other day calcium and magnesium at 100 parts per million. Seaweed, 
once a month. Leading up to the size she is now though, I did only put in half that fertilizer, which was about 150, 160 parts per million. My biggest thing is I do not want any salt buildup on the roots because of her growth habit and where the roots go. Even though they stay within the sheath of the rhizome, sometimes if there's a lot of humidity, they can escape from that sheath and try to find their way to the lecker. Humidity is something that I do not have. I have about 20%, 30% average all year round. Very, very rarely do I see a tenuifolia or any maxillaria root escaping the sheath just because it can. But still, what if? The high humidity around this orchid that is provided by the lecca and the evaporation that is going on in the pot, it can always mean that the roots will escape the sheaths and then what if I have salt buildup on my lecca? So I was conservative at the start. I let her grow to some size and then that the past two years I've been going in with 300 parts per million, but every afternoon she gets flushed. I do the same in the winter. When it comes to my winter care, of course, all her growths have matured by then. I do not fertilize hardly at all. I do supplement with calcium and magnesium, no seaweed. I am not putting any growth hormones in the pot during the winter, but calcium and magnesium, yes, because she does have to deal with some extreme conditions outdoors in the winter. Calcium and magnesium, in my opinion, will strengthen the structures and help them through some of the rough days. But the watering usually is plain R or water or when it rains, it rains and that's what she gets. I don't have any issues with rot because of the high amount of airflow that this orchid gets around my patio and that is something that this orchid really does require. Only recently I have been noticing some of the older pseudobulbs starting to fade. They are still firm and what I would do once I can, I just twist that pseudobulb off to remove it from the orchid. There is no rot going on but as the orchid ages this is what can happen will happen but i don't go in with any kind of scissors or anything because of her tight growth habit and i can do damage to the next bulb so i only just managed to twist this one another 180 degrees and if it doesn't just pop off then i wait for the next time that i can twist an aging pseudobulb off and that can stay like that until the next time i give it a go and you can see right here there are two more that are starting to brown and darken off seedling pseudobulbs. Time to say goodbye and hello to a mature Maxillaria variabilis. So I just twisted one off and you can see very, very firm. Feels like an old nut or something like that. And that's all I do when they start looking like this. Only just happened recently. When it comes to pests, I have had some little issues with mealybugs, usually at the beginning of the season, probably when her juices start flowing again and she starts to produce all the happy sap in preparation for the blooming, but it is really not that big a deal. I'm lucky not to have to deal with any scale because that would be horrendous with this orchid being so tight in her growth habit. Mealybugs, not a problem, garlic alcohol, and they are a thing of the past. And as it is lunchtime now, she's only in the sunlight because of filming. I will now put her back into a very shady spot where she still gets a lot of light but isn't affected by the heat. I hope that this video was helpful, a different perspective, maybe a different setup from other videos that are also linked in the description. Let me know if you have any questions. The comments are there for a reason. And once again, thank you so very, very much for coming over and watching my video. Your time is appreciated. I wish you a beautiful day on one condition though that you please stay safe. Take care. Bye.